What's that? Damn. Trying to get the presentation. What's that? Good question. Uh, maybe.
Okay, at this time, I'd like to call to order the meeting of the City Council Finance Subcommittee with the Technology and Utilities Subcommittee. The clerk, please call, please call the roll. From the Finance Subcommittee, Councilor Scott. Here. Councilor Gitchia. Here. Councilor Robinson. From the Technology Utilities Subcommittee, Councilor Janess. Here. Councilor Mercia. Here. Councilor New. Here. Five present. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a few things on the agenda this evening. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge that we're joined in the chamber tonight by um, CFO Connor Baldwin and the city's energy director, Catherine Moses. Uh, no other counselors hanging around? Okay, uh, we have a few different things on the agenda that all came with uh, some quick presentations from energy director Moses. Uh, the first one up is utility rates and solutions. Ms. Moses? Yes, a little out of order, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. There we go. Thank you, Connor. Appreciate it. All right, so thank you so much, counselors. Thank you for calling the subcommittee so we can talk about some of the things involving energy and our opportunities that we have. And we'll start with kind of the context of rising utility costs. Next slide. So what we know is that even though utility costs at a per kilowatt hour basis have remained relatively flat, most of that is because we have a competitive supply contract that will expire in the fall, winter of 2024. And at that time, we're projecting, based on current market trends, that our overall electricity costs could double. Next slide. And this slide talks about energy demand related to the electricity. So whereas energy in your volumetric charges that we talked about in the last slide are more how far you go, how many kilowatt hours you go, there is a premium for our larger facilities on how fast you get there. And so that's how your uh, demand charges come into play. And you can see that they've been steadily rising for both our G2 and our G3 accounts over the years and are continue, expected to continue to do that. Next slide. Similar with natural gas, right now we have a competitive supplier that gives us relative stability on the gas side of the ledger, but we do expect when those contracts expire in the fall of 2024, you're going to see a significant rise, and these are based on current utility tariffs as well as what we're seeing in the market for supply. Next slide. And so the overall co cost impact of this is, is projected to be significant. And because we know that we're going to have to go out to bid again and we know that our supply costs will be going up, the question then becomes if we're going to see a doubling in our overall utility budgets, what can we do about it? Next slide. And so some of the cost-saving measures we had looked at and going forward is continuing to do what we're already doing, auditing our utility bills. Over the years, since we've been doing this the last fiscal years, we've helped avoid or recover $1.3 million in FY23. So far, that number is $230,000. We also put a procurement out for additional net metering credits that can help offset the costs of our bills. The evaluation for those net metering credits is underway, and we think they could have the potential to save us between $90,000 and $400,000 a year, depending on how that comes out. And then the other two pieces that we can look at are behind the meter solar and energy efficiency, and that's what the next two presentations will be about. Okay, thank you. At this point, I'll open it up to the council, councilors for any questions. Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Noon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, so um, to uh, Catherine uh, Mose, um, I seeing this charge is very helpful. Um, so, in layman term, um, do you know um, on average what low residents spend per month? Um, uh, so let me be, make a little bit more clear about what I'm presenting about. This is more about the costs on the municipal side of the ledger. 
but on the residential side, we did do a separate motion response on that. And you, we do know that the winter bills have been really tough on a lot of customers. We had a national grid event a couple of weeks ago to help out with that kind of thing. We also, our energy advocate has been in, getting an uptick in the amount of people who are looking to him for assistance. He's been assisting them with helping to get on the city's aggregation program, helping to be a part of the discount rate if they qualify, as well as fuel assistance, and connecting them with the mass save energy efficiency programs. So those are kind of the things that we're doing for the residents, and we will continue to do that and support them. And if anybody has problems or they're concerned about their bills, they can reach out to our energy advocate, Victor Vargas. So your, uh, your department now fully staffed in terms of helping, directing a resident to resources and or a way to save them in terms of um, monthly bill, is that correct? Absolutely, Victor is doing an excellent job since he's begun and he is helping more and more people with this kinds of energy costs. What, what some of the things that um, your staff have been doing in terms of, you know, um, addressing this issue? That's a fantastic question. Like I said, since we hired Victor full time and we did that with grant funding through the utility programs as well as Mass CEC, and his job is to advocate for people, to advocate for them, to find energy solutions to their bills. So he attends events most recently. He was at Winterfest this weekend, last week, or the week before, I don't know, all my weeks are running together. National Grid had a large gathering where they were able to sign people up for some of their discounts programs. Uh, we were able to help them sign up for the city's aggregation program, which right now will give you a significant savings over basic service. And of course, the key to reducing all energy bills is to make your home more energy efficient through the Mass Save program. And so we do have a partnership with the utility where we're helping to promote that. Also looking to involve our community partners as well. We've been in discussions with CMAA about how we can leverage resources and help to expand that kind of assistance to people for whom English might not be their first language and always looking for ways to help residents out. But Victor is our go-to person on the residential side and he has been getting some pretty significant numbers in terms of the people that call him. If you're interested, I can follow up and get the number of people he's helped and get metrics on that for you. I just don't have this with me tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, Councillor Scott and then uh, Councillor Mercier. Before we go, I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Victor Vargas, the city's energy advocate, and Camillo, the uh, city's chief de design planner. Thank you for being here. Councillor Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just mention, I know our next discussion is around solar, and obviously with the numbers that you're showing right now for FY25, they're pretty intimidating numbers for the city. Um, almost, did you say almost doubling the rates? If, if current trends continue, we know that it is still a couple of years out, so trends could change, but right now energy costs are very high, and it doesn't seem to be anything that I see in the marketplace where it's going to really go down to where we are now, but we do have different things in place where we can try to get ahead of that. And I, I think we all agree on the urgent need to bring solar into the district, that it's long overdue, any solar projects that have been completed. Um, but I would like to ask, as far as things that could happen a little faster, perhaps, um, I know Amoresco used to do the school systems in the buildings. Have we done like an entity, energy audit, like across our buildings to make sure we're doing best practices right now? So that's a good question. Amoresco did work with our facilities around 2010. I think they finished up the work around 2013. And they did, I believe it was 28 different energy conservation measures across 34 different facilities. We have seen savings from that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the things that were done then either uh, at the time, the decision was to not have Amoresco to maintain these systems and to have them maintained in-house. And so that has its own challenges. We have begun to do more of those types of things. We're currently implementing an 
uh, a green communities grant where we're going to do some of those, for example, the steam trap repairs. That's something that should be done on an annual basis, if possible, because it's been so long. It's a larger kind of thing, but we should see significant savings from that. Of course, we're always implementing energy efficiency projects out of my office in terms of you know different things that are available through us for the utilities. I think right now. I think the projects that are currently in the pipeline of trying to get through law being implemented, things like that, I think it should save us something like a million kilowatt hours a year and 138,000 therms or thereabouts. And, you know, of course, we're also looking at all the federal grant funding that we think will be able to help us get even further along in these kinds of things. And we can go into more details of those as we go further. But we're always looking at energy efficiency opportunities. We're always looking at how we can improve. And even some of the things that were done previously, some of the technology has advanced, particularly around lighting. So we've started to go through and retrofit some of the lighting that was done through Amoresco with LEDs. We'll be doing that in even more facilities if we're successful in our grants. And you know things like upgrading transformers, fixing drives that have failed or are no longer optimal, looking at fixing our control systems, which I think is where you'll really see a lot of changes. I know last year we had done uh, control systems at the Maury Elementary School in Stocklos, uh, and Maury, that was just phenomenal. It was a 41% year-over-year reduction. I think that stock LOSA was only 23% or so, but we're trying to put those things in place to really make sure we are using energy as efficiently as we can. Just one more question, I'm sorry. Do you think, I don't want to put you on a spot on the spot, but do you think we have the internal um, cap capacity to handle you know, that type of work that Amoresco was going to do? I think that we're getting there. Um, I think that, you know, we have been without HVAC technicians for a while. It's my understanding that if they're not hired, they're in the process of being hired. We're looking to do some additional training. Um, there's building operator certification training that's available that's really focused on how you maintain your buildings and thinking about those sort of things. Uh, they estimate that that can save you 1% a year, which doesn't sound like that much until you realize how big our portfolio is and that we use around 39 kilowatt hours a year and around, I think, 1.6 million therms. So it can really make a huge difference. We're looking to invest in those sort of things and invest in things like building envelope work, controls, lighting, some places have refrigeration opportunities. In some places, we'll be looking at windows, looking at creating efficient chiller systems, boilers, all, all of the above kind of things. So. Thank you very much. Council Mercer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, co-chairman. Let me just give this scenario. So try to help me understand what's going on here. And when we say utility costs have risen, I did a little research with myself and my bills. So I looked up February of last year and February of this year with the gas bill that I got. So it was about the same. It wasn't too bad. Now with electricity, I looked on my bill some time ago and it said basic service fixed. That isn't low aggregate. It's a uh, supplier is national grid. Uh, this is electricity. So I did ask, maybe it's more reasonable if I got the low aggregate. And I think they opted me out because I didn't never knew that I was not on the ag aggregate. So you helped me, Catherine. Thank you so much to get on Nextera Energy Services, right? So that's the low aggregate. So having said that, I looked up my February of last year's bill, and it was $249.52. Now, people at home or anyone listening might be saying and thinking, that's not bad. It is bad for me, because I only have four rooms. It's not like I have an upstairs and a downstairs and five rooms downstairs and five upstairs. I don't. It's four small little rooms. It was $249 last February. This February, 
it's $347.66. I don't have any broken windows or anything like that, but it went up $98.14. To me, that's a lot of money to go up. So I'm thinking, would it have gone up even higher had I not go gone on that low aggregate? How do I figure that out? How do I analyze this situation? Or, or does the discounts or the leveling off come after months? I don't know the answer to that. Well, I think it's a complicated answer, and I think the complication is how much energy did you use last year versus this year? That's why when I was doing my presentation, I looked at, first I looked at the cost per kilowatt hour and the cost per therm, because that's what's really gonna go up once we're not on our supply contracts on the municipal side of things, because sometimes there are variations due to weather, like the cold snap that we had a couple of weeks ago where we had a negative 25 wind chill. Obviously, you're gonna be using more gas than than you will with a day more like yesterday where it was so beautiful and sunny and that's kind of levelized by heating degree days. Sometimes when National Grid gives you an energy report, they'll tell you what portion of your bill likely went up due to usage, weather, and other factors. But it really is a, it's a tough metric to gauge year over year. But what we do know though is that many of the supply uh, contracts are going up and I know that people that have National Grid are really getting hammered with that this winter on their electricity bill, but we anticipate, or at this point, I mean, it's all market-based kind of things, so anything could happen between now and the time our supply contract's in, but I'm trying to sort of prepare us mentally for that and look for solutions to help mitigate a portion of that. So could you think, I'm trying to make myself feel a little better, and I'm thinking, just imagine if I didn't switch over, would that $98 increase be probably 115? It probably would have more than doubled your bill because last winter I believe that basic service, the supply was close to 15 or 16 cents and now it's closer to 34 cents. So that's where people are really getting hit hard on that. So if you weren't on the aggregation, yes, that would have been even worse. Okay, so I feel a lot better now. Thank you very much. I can calculate the exact amount if you uh, want to share your bill with me. But. Thank you. Councilor Gittrick. Thank you, Chairman. I just have a couple questions. Um, on my end, I, I agree with the um, approach we're taking now. And after the meter is more what I envision happening. And when I look at some of the numbers and you, you just start looking through, you should have never gave me the other ones in advance because that's where my, I first went to. So I went to the potential phasing. And when you add up just in uh, phase one, there's 2,720 kilowatts that could be estimated savings. If today those were all online, what would that savings roughly be? I can't say. And the reason I can't say is because it depends on how those projects actually um, come out. So those are the, the ones that are in, and I don't know if it would make sense to transition to that presentation since the question specifically on that or if there were other things that had, um, that were part of the question on the utility rate increases. But the reason I can't answer that is I don't know what the uh, for example, a power purchase agreement rate would be, and that will depend on where you're starting. Some things may need additional upgrades. Some things may, you know, the estimated amount based on something that you see on a satellite view might be different from what's on the actual rooftop itself. But I think that we can find ways to get those numbers in relative short time for a municipal government. And so if you want to transition to that presentation, I'd be happy to talk about that. Well, I, I do also have another question on, um, are we in constant contact with the Department of Public Utilities? Because their mission is to try to keep the rates as low as possible, but give us a safe, so, and, and I don't see it happening. It's, as much as people wanna say, you know, they're doing the best they can, I just personally don't see it happening when you see the amounts going up and some of the spending that's going on in some of these companies. But again, that's not for us to say. 
but I'm just wondering if, if the City of Lowell is in constant contact with the Department of Public Utilities, making them aware of our plight, and I'm sure they know many communities, but I don't think a lot of communities are in the same position as, as the City of Lowell and, and other cities with similar dynamics to it. Do we talk to the Department of Public Utilities at all? Well, the Department of Public Utilities has their own sort of structures and the ways that they bring cases forward. Uh, the rate increases that are being seen this winter had to be approved by the Department of Public Utilities, and they were based on the RFP that the utilities had put out. And so I think it's just a product of just the different things that are happening in the world with inflationary pressures, with the geopolitical dynamics, with supply, um, I guess, shortages in a lot of different areas, including in the energy area. And so that has to be factored into the price. In terms of, do, we, do I personally read through DPU filings? Yes. Did we, a few months ago, have a um, something on there concerned about the citizens, and we brought it to our, we actually have sent a couple of different things to our delegation in terms of looking at can we do something like a gas aggregation program for our residents the way that we have for electricity? Can we advocate for other means to be brought forward to help people get through this really rough period? So all that's been taken up to the delegation level. As for the day-to-day -day, uh, inner workings of the DPU, I don't think that's something we have as much influence on. I think we need to change our path and actually challenge them. And I mean, I, I understand. I've, I've challenged them before when I was at the Water Department. They came in and said that we didn't have a right to charge them markouts, which is an ordinance in the city of Lowell. And we did have the right to charge them it. And there was a deal that was made beyond my pay grade. But I think that somebody has to start, communities have to start challenging the Department of Public Utilities because at some point it's a quasi state agency that runs, I, I won't say what I'm thinking in my mind, but going to our state reps and everyone is a small step we need to start writing further and further to the governor we need to start writing to the department of utilities because this is hurting a lot of people and it's hurting a lot of growth at the same time when you take away disposable income you take away growth in the city of lowell's disposable income is so close to the poverty line that there is no growth and this is extremely important for us as a, as a board to try to make a statement and whether we get buy-in or not, at least we're challenging the system. The system needs to change. It needs to change in the favor of our community because we just simply don't have the disposable income to keep challenging this. And that's why I like the um, potential of adding the solar panels in behind the meter because we can start looking at solutions. Talking about bills, and, and I agree with Councilor Mercy, when I look at my bills, I, I feel the same way. But it's not about me, I make enough money. There are people who are so close to that poverty line who are heating from one bedroom or their kitchen, they're in there, they got their stove on with it open right now. And that's the challenge. It's not so much about the people who can, you know, yeah, I can't buy certain things afterwards, but I do think we need to find a solution and we need to challenge these quasi departments that are run ragged throughout this state and start challenging the Department of Public Utilities and saying, we can't keep taking this. Thank you. Councilor Scott. Thank you. Just one more comment, just because you brought it up, it was on my list, the gas aggregation. I'd actually brought that motion forward to the council and the council had supported trying to push our, you know, our ability to offer a gas aggregate. Um, have you received anything back on that yet at this time from the, you reached out to the state delegation, you said? I know that the state delegation has the request from the council. I don't know what the current status of is of possibly potentially looking at putting into legislation or finding other ways and means, but if that's something of interest, we can see if we can get an update on that through the manager's office. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, any other comments on this item? We move to the next. All right, let's move to item number two, which is development of behind the meter solar solutions across the city. All right, so let's just talk a little bit about our current behind the meter solar. So we currently have 935.1 kilowatts of solar assets deployed across our portfolio. 
From the time they were installed through FY22, they generated about 10.4 million kilowatt hours of renewable energy, helped save about $886,000 and avoid 1.6 million pounds of CO2 equivalent, which is the equivalent of 12,233 tree seedlings grown for 10 years and the carbon sequestered by that. So we've gotten good results. So what are we going to do to develop more solar? We put out a request for information in September of 22 to the solar development community to look at what we can do on additional municipal properties. Topics included a high-level portfolio analysis of feasibility, preferred configurations. Do you want to do rooftop? Do you want to look at um, canopies? Do you want to do some other kind of ground-based configuration? project elements to enhance solar benefits, can we integrate EVs with them, can we integrate storage, and general considerations for development. So what we found from the RFI is that 21 of our properties were assessed to have solar potential, and I'll emphasize that it's potential. You won't really know exactly how this will pan out until you start doing the engineering analysis and the high level types of things that solar companies do. 11 properties were not recommended for solar at this time. Uh, so they recommended power purchase agreements or site leases to reduce the overall costs without the need for project capital or system maintenance. And then they also indicated in the response that ownership of the panels could allow us to take advantage of direct pay provisions, but there could be challenges with system care and maintenance. And in some configurations, those same benefits could be realized through PPA agreements. So. What I'm looking at is potential phasing of projects because the limiting factor is always our infrastructure. You need to be able to support the panels for 20 plus years and a lot of our roof structures are just not at that same age. And so the question is how do we develop this in a phased way with what we have? And so I kind of broke it into phase one, two, and three. In phase one, we'll start with the roof structures that are in the process of being upgraded either through the MSBA program, the new high school, different things like that, or we can start the structural analysis on canopies for things like the parking garages. Estimated time of completion for those projects is three to five years. Phase two includes roof structures that have the potential to be upgraded for grants such as the Renew America Schools grant or that there are other things that are happening at certain sites that would need to be kind of worked out first before we look at putting solar there. So that we're estimating be six to eight years. And then phase three, we don't really have the infrastructure that we need, but through a combination of capital funding, um, structural analysis, grants that are available, we think within 10 years or 10 plus years, we can get the rest of this. So what are our phase one projects? So we think that even if these don't all completely pan out, we think that there are opportunities for canopies at our garages. I will emphasize that these are estimated sizes and the actual sizes would be based on a deeper, more detailed analysis. We believe you can concurrently do EV charging at all the garages. Um, and then we also know that we are going to be having new roof structures on Lowell High School, McAuliffe Elementary, the Robinson Middle School, and the Wang Middle School. And I do apologize, I believe in my motion response I didn't include Wang in phase one, that was just a typo on my part. So those are kind of our first tranche of projects we think we can get within the next three to five years. Phase two, the Daly Middle School, Merkland Elementary School, and STEM Academy, all of those roof structures were put into the Renew America Schools grant. So we think that those are a six to eight year time frame. If we're successful in getting the grant, then we would have to get those built and integrated in a solar ready manner, but we believe that we can do that in that next tranche. And also there's some work going on over at Cali Stadium right now that we don't think it would necessarily be appropriate for phase one, but we do think we could get a canopy there potentially in phase two. Next slide. And then you have the other places where we think there's potential, where we would have to look at in updating our infrastructure through capital funding, through grant funding, combination thereof. That would be the DPW, Parks Headquarter, JFK, uh, Lincoln Elementary, the Pine Arts School, Stocklosa Middle School, Washington Elementary School, storage potential at Stocklosa, EV charging potential at JFK. 
Next slide. So based on this, there are multiple procurement paths that are available to pursue solar development. But because we know that these energy cost rises are coming over the next couple of years, we think that if we look at a route through expedited procurement through what's called the Power Options Program, which is codified in Mass General Law Section or Chapter 164, Section 137. And with this option, Power Options is a nonprofit entity that was created by the Commonwealth to aggregate buying power and negotiate energy buying deals. It'll help us secure a smart block program quicker, resulting in potential for better cost savings. They have turnkey solar systems with fixed costs on major project components. And for project components that would be site-specific, power options as an entity has to audit and approve those variable kind of costs. So we'll always be getting the best deal. They have 470 members including 106 municipalities, and they've installed over 85 megawatts of solar capacity. It does require that you join power options, which for just their solar plant plan is about $1,000, and that would get us through the French Trancha projects. They would do all of the analysis to see if what they estimated on paper actually matches up to what our site conditions are. That would give us a better idea of when we can secure um, incentive blocks that will help to make the project more viable economically. And because it's a procurement that is already factored in any increases in uh, what would be uh, the in investment tax credit. So for some of our properties that are in a lower income area, they're eligible through the IRA for enhanced incentives through that. And so if, if it were the will of the council, the will of the body, I think that that's something that can get us there faster, but we can certainly go out to competitive bid as well because there are additional procurement paths for that. Thank you very much. Um, any of my colleagues have any questions? Councilor Getcher. Thank you, Catherine. So when you look at all three phases and you look at the total amounts of everything and you go back to phase one, which is the one that would be the closest, I don't understand still how the high school is three to five years out, but so may it be. Um, but when you look at the, in phase three and you just look at the three top ones, the Roy Garage, Lot A, and the high school, if you put them all together and you add up all three phases, 33.3% of the total all three phases adjust those three places. So those are the places we should be working on right away and saying, look, you know what? 33% of all three phases are those three places. And one of them is the high school. So when you look at the high school, you're like, this is kind of a no-brainer. I don't understand. And, and I thank you for putting this together because I think it's ab abundance of information that can be put forward. So um, I think that's something worthy of looking at the Roy Garage Lot A in Lowell High School if they're only three to five years out. I would think Lowell High School may be able to be put forward even faster if the funding's obviously there. Well, I, I thank you again for pointing that out. That's an excellent piece of information. And I think the challenge with the high school is there is construction going on there right now. So it makes sense to not be working the same construction until the building's actually built, which is probably going to be fall of 24. And then, but I do think, you know, I try to have conservative estimates on that three to five years because we don't know what the analysis will show us until we actually get in there. There might be challenges um, for interconnection agreements. There might be challenges in needing to upgrade electrical services. There might be other challenges in working around, for example, existing construction. But I think that, you know, I think it's something that we would like to get it online sooner rather than later. And I think that we have options to do that. Just one thing. Most people would say, when you're in the middle of construction, do all your construction. Not wait till construction's done to start opening up walls again and do construction but in the roof. But again, I, I don't think it's that much to add on to. I think it's there. It's just it must be pushed back somewhere along the line. But I don't think that adding solar to this project is that far outside the range of what is done on most new buildings today. I mean, it's a conversation that could be had with 
with Suffolk and with the OPM, but I think it's just, it's challenging when you have different contractors and subcontractors that have different equipment. And it's challenging with solar too, because we don't have an existing load profile for the new buildings that are being built. And we don't even have a full year of data in the gym because it was just turned over in August. But it's, it's a, if it's a conversation that you would like us to have, we can definitely have that conversation. Thank you. Chancellor Scott? No. Okay, um, I, I just had one quick question, if no one else does, which is just around the Roy Garage that, uh, that Councillor Getcher mentioned, and probably some of the other garages as well. The Roy Garage is getting up to 50 years of time in service. I don't know how long we expect um, a building like that to stick around, and if we're planning on having it for the 20 years that you mentioned um, to have those, the, the canopy on top of it. Um, I don't know if that's something you can speak to or if that's a better question for someone who knows the building better. Well, I, I think that that's a valid concern and I think that's why these are just things with potential and not things that we know that we can develop because the age of the garages is something that will go into it. You know, there's a, a different kind of structural analysis that's done and different kinds of testing that would be done for something like a canopy on a garage versus, you know, a rooftop uh, solar system. But I think, you know, if, if there was the will of the council to move forward with these projects in an expedited manner, I think we can get those kinds of answers on a faster time frame. But I know that no solar developer is going to put a system on something that may be obsolete in a few years down the road did kind of, kind of make sure that it's going to stand for the lifetime of the solar. But I know that there are also ways they've done that in other communities where they can kind of make those upgrades and build that into the project cost. Okay, thank you very much. I, I, personally speaking, I do think that um, that is something the council will be looking to explore, but I'll leave that to my colleagues to make a, make a motion if they like. Councilor New. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman or Co-Chairman, um, Co-Chairperson. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Most. Um, I think I do concur with Councilor Kachia that is, um, you know, uh, it's, it's up to this council uh, to have this conversation with, you know, the, um, um, the Suffolk construction and whoever else that we need to have these conversations. Uh, three years, I know, I understand, heard you loud and clear, that is your estimate between three to five years. My question also what to do with the phase, the, the three phase. How did you come up with the, the three phase? Is that a consultant or is that the request of information uh, they provide you with that? Did they do a study of all this building and they, hidden, they come up with this phase? Uh, I'm the one who actually came up with the phases based on responses from the RFI. So the RFI, the, the key kind of limiting factor they found was sort of can your infrastructure support this? And so based on what I knew about the age of our roof structures, for instance, I kind of put those in those different buckets. We know that we're getting new roof structures here. We know that we're going to put in more there. We know that these are things where we still need to look at that infrastructure upgrade kind of piece. So it wasn't something that came directly from the RFI, but it was kind of pulled out from that. And then you also have to factor in just what we know about construction lead times on some of the equipment, conversations that we've had with different kinds of developers and things like that. And so I tried to provide what I consider to be a conservative estimate it's possible that we can get solar done in a faster time frame than that, but I think the conservative estimate would be three to five years. That could allow for the procurement, that could allow for the development of the project to see what's actually viable to get pricing related to that and to see if that's something that we want to move forward on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chairman. Councilor Scott. Thank you. Um, my only question is on the recommendation here, that you have a recommendation for us to um, consider an expedited pa procurement pathway for phase one projects through power options programs. Is that something that's going to come forward to the full council or should we make a motion to, I guess we'll make a motion to bring that forward for a recommendation to the entire council? 
Uh, that's something that if the council would like to weigh in on that and pursue that pathway, I think it's something that would be advantageous. It's not, I guess, strictly required, but if the council would like to see more solar development, having the support of the full council would be helpful. And this particular motion was also referred to the full council or it's also on the full council agenda. So maybe that's something, if you wanted to make that recommendation that we go forward okay. from there. So I would make a motion um, that the, the city manager bring forward a recommendation to move forward with this. A second. second. It's almost a unanimous second there. Yeah. <laughs> we give it to the dean of the council. Ms. Wait. Clark, would you call the roll on that? Council get you. Could we add to that motion that we have actual numbers put to it? They have the kilowatts, so we should be able to put some numbers in going forward so that we know cost versus benefit. I, I think that that's the key to this. Yeah, we have all these numbers here, but at the end of the day, we don't know cost benefit versus think, what's going to happen. So I, I think that that is the key going forward. What is the cost today to put those on there? What's the 20 year benefit of it? Where's the delta where it starts earning us money? That's what they did at the water treatment plant when those were put in. And if, if I can just say that it might be putting the cart before the horse a little bit, but before we would move forward with uh, direct contracting for all of these, those are things that we would consider. We would want to know what are the 20 year financials that are associated with this. And these are just high level estimates. So I don't think from high level estimates, you're going to be able to get those numbers. You could get a high level estimate on the high level estimates. But I think, you know, in terms of moving the projects forward, I think if you went forward with the power options and then you can have it be something that can be kind of a recurring, if the council would like a quarterly update on where we are and where, what projects we think are, can viably move forward and what the economics are once we know that. But I don't think it's something that can be done before you decide to move forward with this power options, if that makes sense. I just think as, as we start to go forward and start looking at these projects, we have to have some kind of number from somewhere where the cost versus benefit is because it's three to five years out today. So if you keep moving and kicking, and we've been talking about these things for a year, and, and here we are, we finally got to this point, but it's important that we move forward. We have construction people over at the high school. It may be much cheaper while they're there. We don't know that answer. And it may be something that, like, um, I had spoken to the CFO, and like he said, it, MSBA doesn't pick up anything of the cost for solar, which, okay, but if there's a payout going forward on it and we can get a savings while we have contractors here that may bid on a project like this, then let's try to figure out numbers, real-time numbers that, you know, uh, obviously we're not going to go out to bid on it and try to get those numbers, but people will have similar designs in other places where they can say, here's the cost per unit. That, that, that would just be my take on it while we have people in the city doing these ty this type of work. Okay. The motion on the floor from Councillor Scott was to have the city manager bring the expedited procurement pathway through power options program to the full council for consideration. Um, unless there's a will to amend that motion, I think we'll vote on it. Mr. Clark, please call the roll. Councilor Scott. Yes. Councilor Gitchia. Yes. Councilor Robinson. Councilor Janess. Yes. Councilor Mercia. Yes. Councilor Noom. Yes. Uh, five years. Thank you. Um, it's five minutes before the city council meeting at this time. Um, Ms. Moses, I don't know how deep the, the third item on the agenda goes. Would you like to save that for a continuation of this meeting or, or run through it now? Uh, we could probably run through it now. I could do a super quick thing because a lot of this we discussed at the last uh, council meeting that I was at, but this was just a chance to go through it a little bit further. So basically, there are a lot of opportunities for once a generation investment through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also called the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and the Inflation Reduction Act. Next slide. So the Inflation Reduction Act was signed last August. There's a guidebook for it to try and build a clean energy economy, lower energy costs, tackle climate change, and reduce pollutants. Next slide. Part of this is $45 billion in funding to address issues that are specific to Lowell and might be relevant to Lowell. Obviously, we won't get the full $45 billion, but these are the grant programs that are available. Um, 
They also have the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed in November of 21. The guidebook was put out in 22. We're currently going through the Renew America Schools Grant and the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant programs. And the um, Renew America Schools Grant, we're submitting a $15 million application for deep energy retrofits for schools in disadvantaged communities. We think that'll save us 30 to 41%, depending on the building and the portfolio. And then for the conservation block, uh, energy efficiency and conservation block grant program, I don't know if that slide made it on here or not. There we go. Uh, we're still waiting on guidance for that. We have $159,000. We think we could do building envelope weatherization work at City Hall, at the library, still waiting on more guidance. But there's a lot of money out there. We're looking at all the above solutions so we can try and get ahead of some of these massive energy costs. Thank you, Ms. Moses. Any questions on this item? No, nope. just, I would just comment thank you for, for all the work you've been doing on this. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so we have gotten through everything. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Thank you.